Welcome to the Calder Farmstead. Now the ice hockey back out to center in transition. Carlson with Quinville two on one. Right with Carlson across the Quinville scores. Here's the chance for Barrett. Five feet scores! Off the face off! Up it's Eminger. Go back to Wierenski. Has it. Shoots one. Bounces off a man. Five seconds left. Wierenski. Another jam on the shot. Curry and fire it. And now, with nine minutes gone in overtime, the Bears breaking out right side with Bear. Looks like cutting to the net. Bear again. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! And here are your hosts, CeCe and Sean. Hello and greetings from the mile high city of Denver, Colorado. And Portland, Maine. Ah. Welcome to the Calder Farmstead Podcast, episode number 108. 108 for Tuesday, September 6th. 2022. If you're hoping for a podcast featuring tips on the best times to pick ripe apples in the Northeast United States, we are not going to be much help. This is an American Hockey League podcast, and my name is CeCe Hockley, the AHL editor of Full Press Hockey. And I'm Sean O'Brien from St- uh, from StatsTrack and the AHL's only league-wide analytics guy. And it's been a while, so uh, as always, thanks for tuning in with us. If you are new to hearing CC and I talk, uh, we're going to be in off-season mode here, uh, and we do have a big interview for you. Um, however, we still recommend uh, checking out episode zero. It's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about later in the season, you know, throughout the course of the show, previous episodes, that whole thing. And uh, it's about you know the stats we're going to talk about as well as how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're new to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms like PDO or the point shares model, or some of the newer hockey uh, terms like controlled zone entries, go check that out so you better be able to pick up what we're putting down. I promise it's not that nerdy or technical. It's only 20 minutes. And let's be honest, you wasted 20 minutes watching the Iowa and South Dakota State football game. You will never get that time back. So next time, why not spend a little more time with us talking hockey? Two first half field goals, one from either side of the team, and two safeties from Iowa in the second half. <laughs> Maybe go check out the stats on YouTube if you if oh. you have some morbid curiosity. But <laughs> if you have that kind of self self loathing, uh, you should really see, seek professional help. Uh, yeah, that game was unwatchable. Um, yeah. but we do have one piece of business to complete for the 21-22 season that we didn't wrap up in our last episode. You know, we got so uh, so excited talking about the Calder Cup finals and all that happened. It completely left our minds uh, until about a week later. We're like, oh yeah, we have business to finish. We'll get there. So now we are going to f- close the books as soon as we finish the Goalie Pool 80 Challenge. Uh, we did it a different bit, a bit different last season uh, where we made the choice to switch from the Goalie Pool Six Pack Challenge uh, to the 80 Challenge. Um, None of the coaches claimed their beer, and I had to drink it all, and that really didn't do well for my health. So we went to the Goalie Pool 80 Challenge, uh, honoring Mattis Kevle- uh, Mattis Kevlenix. Um, but the criteria stayed the same. All you had to do was pull your goalie uh, win behind at 70% of the mathematically correct time to do so, and we'd donate. Uh, a team down by one goal at home needed to pull with 254 left in the game, or down by one on the road, the time mark was 321. They were down by two goals, 407 at home, 520 on the road. We found nine times in the 21-22 regular season that a coach had a successful goalie pool 80 challenge. Those nine are by no means an exhaustive list. So if you happen to saw an instance where your team, you know, pulled the goalie within those marks and we might have missed it, let us know. We're happy to correct the list and uh, update our donation. But for each successful challenge, we are donating $10 to the Mattis Kevlenix Fund run by the Columbus Blue Jackets. So we are sending our $90 for those nine successful challenges. And like all of our, you know, donations to charity, uh, the receipt will be posted uh, with this episode um, when the it comes out. So please uh, check it out, check out the whole episode. But uh, we definitely, you know, we, we take donating to charity very seriously here on the Calder Farmstead. And we make sure that uh, it's always transparent when we do so. All right. Our guest for this episode has collected many track suits from North American professional hockey. Uh, if you're keeping count at home, seven NHL teams started for 14 AHL teams and 
one ECHL team, the Las Vegas Wranglers. Retiring in 2019 after 15 seasons of play, he became a columnist for NHL.com before jumping over to the Vegas Golden Knights as a TV analyst. He's now a freelance goaltending coach at 44 Vision Hockey and writes as a NHL analyst for DailyFaceOff.com. Please welcome to the program, Mike McKenna. Mike, hey, you're everybody. in the show. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome, man. Thanks for the great intro. You know, it's it feels like at this point I'm just collecting titles, which is great. I'm also the volunteer goalie coach at St. Lawrence University and occasionally appear on Sirius XM radio and help host there with Steve Coolius and the power play on uh, during the week. So, dude, it's it's busy now, and that's on top of coaching two youth hockey teams that my daughters play on as well as the St. Louis Blues Warriors team comprised of veterans all with a 10% or greater disability rating that uh, serve for our military. So yeah, man, I'm a pretty busy guy, but I'm really pumped to talk to you guys because this is about the American League, which is near and dear to my heart. It's where I spent most of my career. So I'm really excited to be on with you guys. Absolutely. And as I'm sure you can see from our elaborate outline, the American League is very clearly near and dear to us as well. We are so pumped to have what is an American Hockey League legend in yourself on the show. Uh, let's get right to it. Um, one of the big questions I have is a lot more about your goaltending expertise, because you were a goaltender that played in, in this league and above. And like goaltending is hard for non-goalies to grasp. One of the big questions that I had is, in other interviews, uh, you said you were grateful for your time in the ECHL because you said your game wasn't ready for the AH AHL yet. And I feel like as a non-goalie, I have no idea what that actually means. And I was hoping that you could elaborate more on what that meant to you. You know, to me, I think realistically, the American League is sink or swim. If you're not ready for it and you show up and you're not ready, you're not gonna last long and you won't get a second chance. And, you know, especially for me coming out of St. Lawrence University, where I played four years at, um, I didn't sign with the National Predators, the team that drafted me, which has this beautiful mustard yellow jersey that's over my, over my shoulder here. Um, so, you know, I was a free agent coming out and I went to American League camp with the Omaha Urban Knights with Curtis McElhaney, um, you know, as our first, and, and we came back together later in my career, but um, I, I thought I was pretty good in that camp, but realistically, you're dealing with big time NHL's prospects at that point. Players that are gonna be in the league the next year or two. And I just don't think that my career coming out of St. Lawrence and being a number one goaltender for realistically about two years towards the end and being on a poor team where we didn't win a lot of games, like I think I needed to go somewhere where I could succeed and win and post good numbers and feel good about myself and learn pro hockey. And ECHL Vegas, man, I hit the jackpot walking in there, you know, to, I mean, to coin a pun, right? I'm going to Vegas, right? I hit the jackpot, but I really did. I had Glenn Gullitson as our head coach in Vegas and our team was good and it was fun. And it just was the perfect setup for me to prepare myself for when I finally got a real chance at the American Hockey League, which um, was my third season when I went to the Portland Pirates, the jersey that you are currently wearing, Sean, right now, and which I also have over my right shoulder, and that was with the Anaheim Ducks organization. Uh, Mike, uh, next question. Your career in the AHL, uh, since we've, we're moving on from the AHL, uh, the ECHL, moving to the AHL, it took you to a new team almost every season, which isn't terribly uncommon in the AHL for talented veteran players, but it does always kind of surprise me. You think guys have a career year for a team and they want to stay, but you know, in your experience and for anyone else who, you know, you saw move teams often during your career, uh, what was the mindset behind these choices or was there simply uh, no offer to stay from the teams that you had played for? I never turned down an offer to stay in the same city. I'll put it that way. Um, I would say that probably during my career, 80% of the teams that I, and organizations that I played for, I would have loved to have stuck around another season. Um, but the realistic outlook is that I turned into the layover guy real early in my career because I wasn't a draft choice. I wasn't a prospect of these teams. I was the fill-in veteran goaltender. And even by 25 or 26, that's what it became for me. So, you know, I just looked at it as the next adventure every time when it came and it was just trying to find the right place to sign with that I thought I was going to get to play and maybe get some NHL minutes. And um, and quite truthfully, the team that offered me the first contract 
is usually who I signed with because my belief was that was the team that wanted me the most, that had a plan for me. And even if the money wasn't there or other factors, I thought, you know what, if they believe, I think it'll work out. And most times it did. So, um, you know, I, I really thought that the only place I could consider home during my American Hockey League career would have been Portland, Maine. I adore Portland, Maine. We still like to go back and vacation there. I mean, I'm in St. Louis. It's a chore to get to Portland, okay? <laughs> so, like, we drove an odyssey this summer to go see my in-laws in upstate New York, and then we went even further to Maine because we had to go back. We love Portland that much. It's where my youngest daughter was born. She's our little Mainer. Um, I played three seasons there, but I did it for three different organizations. And that's pretty wild when you think about it. And if the team hadn't been sold and moved to Springfield, Massachusetts, I would have played three years in a row in Portland, Maine, which would have been amazing. So um, it was definitely a factor for me. There are places I would have loved to have stayed. I mean, I was heartbroken when um, Dallas decided that they wanted to sign Colton Point and bring him in to start his pro career. And I didn't get a chance to continue with the team that we went to the Calder Cup finals. And I was you know, same way in Syracuse, go to the Calder Cup finals and they decided to sign Mike Layton instead of myself. And I thought that was a lateral move and I was mad about it. And But you know what? When teams deal with you in a professional manner, like the Lightning did, like Julian Breezeblad did, he called me and said, we're just, we're going in a different direction. I never had a problem with it. There was no grudge held there at all. So um, I, I really do envy though, the American League players that have had a long tenure in one city or one organization, because as you can see, it's exceedingly rare. With the prospects float that are coming through organizations, it's just really hard for some of the older guys to hang on to those positions in a city for anything more than a year or two. And I think that was some of the, the when I was looking over your career and seeing like the, the jumps that made, I was like, okay, I understand like, if you have two young prospects, they need to play somewhere, you know, the, the 26 year old guy who was not your prospect, not your draft choice, he clearly gets the ax in that spot. But there were a lot of ones where I was just like, like you posted, you know, good years, uh, you know, in 07 and 08 in Portland, uh, 908 save percentage, followed it up with a 904 in Norfolk in 0809. And it was like, and no one came knocking the next year. And like, you've, you've talked about this in other yeah. places. And I was just like, man, that seems crazy to me that like, Every team was just like, oh, yeah, we definitely can't go and get the guy who's, you know, still has many good years ahead of him as a goaltender who's shown that he can post, you know, a, a, 90, a, a 908 and a 904 aren't like, oh, my God, please sign this goalie now numbers. But they're still respectable starting goalie numbers. Well, especially when you compare it to my goalie partners. OK, yeah. so Kari Rama was in the eights. And when you look at part, and that was in Norfolk, and he was a hot prospect. And then when you look at Portland, and I was at a 908, and the rest of the goalies, aside from J.S. O'Ban, who came in at the very end of the year, were way below myself as well. I, and, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, I feel terribly bothered by this because I understand how it works. I know why teams will push their younger goaltender, their prospect goaltender, because they see the ceiling in them. But... Look at my numbers compared to Robin Leonard's in Binghamton. Look at my numbers compared to Jake Allen's in Peoria. And those are two of my, like, my... Dude, Jake Allen's one of my best buds on earth, dude. But, like, frankly, I deserve to be called up by the Blues at one point, okay? But he was their prospect. And when he showed up, man, he played awesome. And he grabbed it. And I was so pumped for him, you know? So was I going to be mad about it? Like, I mean, internally, of course, I was frustrated at times. Because when you look through my stats in my career... The reason why I had the career I did is because I outplayed my goalie partner almost everywhere. And, you know, I had one bad year in, in Albany that I thought my career might be over. I mean, it, my numbers look like a credit card. Team was terrible. We finished last in the league. Like, team didn't even get along. And for some reason, Ottawa gave me a contract for the next year, you know, and then – I kind of reestablished myself that year. So that was really the only down season I had in the American League. And if you look really at like even advanced metrics, you don't get to see like goal saved above average. But I found a guy on Twitter a few years ago who had him in the American League. And dude, I was like, okay, was that you, Sean? Like, I don't know if it was me, but I did do that for a time. Uh, like I had uh, goal saved above average charted on one of our pages. I don't yeah. have it anymore because it tracked so closely to one of the other metrics I tracked. It was like, all right, we're telling the same story in two in one graph. So, but yeah, yeah. like 
basically, dude, I was like top five, top 10 in the American League every year. And I was proud of that. But because of my status as just being the veteran, the layover guy, I, it, it wasn't going to work for me unless I got to the NHL and played. I needed to play probably 20 games lights out in the NHL for me to have a chance to stick there at the stage of my career where it was. Yeah. And one, I never got that chance. And two, I wasn't on teams that were good enough. I was on one in my NHL career. I was on one team that was even like close to playoffs, you know, so I, it, maybe that sounds like I'm blaming other people, but I'm also realistic. I know how to judge these things by this point in my life. And so I think I got the most out of my career. I'm proud of it. And I, and honestly, a lot of those goaltenders that I played with, I was really, really happy to see them go on and have great careers, man. Cause that, I, you know, I felt a part of that in some way. Like if I, whether I pushed them, whether we were friends, whether we worked together on the ice, like there's a little bit of a sense of ownership in that and something that, you know, for someone like myself, I, I should be proud of that. And I am, I'm proud of those relationships and friendships and what they've been able to do with their careers. Absolutely. It's more, my, my thought is more of just like, it, it's not so much you shouldn't be proud of it or what you did there. It's more of just, I'm amazed that like there definitely seemed like there were times where you were fighting for a contract or like hoping yeah. someone gave it to you. And I'm just, I just look at it and I'm like, like I looked uh, at, at players t or goaltenders today where it's like, Felix Sandstrom's played 66 AHL games over the last two seasons with the Phantoms. He's now 25. He just got a, a contract re-up from the Flyers and he's never put up a season that was 908. Yeah. Uh, Uka Pekka Lukanen in Rochester today just signed a new one. He's never put up that good. And I'm just like, how do you, like, I understand he's not your We're prospect. talking like one-way contracts, man. Yeah. And I'm like, like, dude, I never made over 200 grand until I was well over 30. You know I what just, I mean? If you want to talk money, like, yeah. I, just man, look at it like I understand that you looked at Mike McKenna as not having their ceiling and their potential or whatever. That's abstract and I'll trust those judgments. But like, you needed a veteran goalie, and this dude has absolutely proved that, like, he's not going to come in and give you 825 goaltending. Like, it, it struck me as just strange that there was there were times where it's like, yeah, I was fighting for a contract. I'm like, that's insane to me. Like, that's I'm never going to be a GM of a team, but, like, if you show me a dude who's a 908 goaltender in the AHL, I'm like, if no one else wants him, I'll happily see, you know, what happens. We'll throw him a contract, but. Well, I mean, most of my years were realistically 915 or above a lot. Yeah. And so, like, you know, we finished, we went to the Calder Cup finals with Syracuse, and I didn't think I was going to have a contract. Like, I went up till the day of free agency, and I had no, like, nothing going on. And I, like, I remember being on an anniversary trip with my wife. We're in Portland, Oregon, and I'm just, like, down, like, thinking, this sucks. I might be out of this. I'm 35. And then Dallas came calling. And offered me, and I actually got two offers on free agency day that I didn't expect. And so I had one offer. I won't mention who it was, but I had an American League only offer from a team in the East that was for bigger money than what I was offered on an NHL two-way with Dallas. And I took the two-way in Dallas in a heartbeat yeah. because I'd, I'd played in the East for so long in my life. And I'd had Texas and Dallas on my radar as an organization that I, I mean, probably number one on my list. Really? Yeah. And, and, and because, because of the people in charge, because of Jim Nill, the GM, because of everybody that I knew within that organization and, and the location and all that. Um, 50 grand didn't mean anything to me when I had Texas off. You know what I mean? That's kind of what it comes down to. So it's funny though, after a while in the American League, you start to be able to pick and choose if you have those chances. Um, but I also knew that, man, if, if my numbers weren't good, I wasn't going to get a deal. So that was motivation that I had to stay on top of my game mentally, physically, technically, or else I might be on the unemployment line or looking at Europe. And by the time you got a dog and two kids, you really don't want to go to Europe. And myself, I didn't want to go to Russia no matter what, because I value my life and I value our family. And I also have a degree and I don't have to do hockey. That's the way I looked at it. it all right, as much as I would love to stay and commiserate about GM decisions that I just stare at and I'm like, what are we doing? We, we do need to move on here. Uh, big question for you. What was the AHL team that uh, you felt treated you the best overall? Maybe didn't necessarily give you the most money, but gave you, you know, the nicest person was generally just uh, an organization that you wanted to come to work for every day. Well, you know, I probably already answered that with Texas. Um, that was just that was just a dream, man, to play there. Like that organization was was phenomenal in all facets. I mean, from perks to money, to living conditions, to everything, um, it was really good. 
Uh, but that's not to say that I didn't have other ones that I really enjoyed. You know, I, I'm looking around the room of shame here with jerseys and, um, you know, like one of them, I, li I really like to point out how much I appreciated Columbus as an organization, even though Springfield Mass wasn't like it wasn't a destination, but I always felt that that was an organization that treated players the right way. You know, like I'm there for a Christmas party and they've got a Santa Claus for the kids and toys that you can take like a present okay it's not big money stuff but it matters and you know even when i finished my career with the phantoms in philly like it was kind of a dream come true because they were a team i'd always kick their ass actually <laughs> and they finally <laughs> wisened up to pick me up and then uh and then it just turned into be a, like an awesome scenario they they treated myself and my family so well especially knowing that it was kind of the exit of my career um it's hard to pick that you know, so I, I didn't have many, I didn't have many bad ones. I had a lot of them that were okay, um, but I definitely had. You think of Texas and and like I mentioned, Allentown and and Syracuse. Man, my time at Syracuse it may have been brief, but it was amazing. I would have loved to have stayed there another year. I really enjoyed that city and playing there. It was my favorite rink in the American League. So um, it's easy to forget when you played for this many, but those three stand out pretty quickly. On the flip side of that, uh, who would you say, and maybe you don't have to name names if you don't want to, because I know throwing people under the bus is not a, a hockey culture thing, but uh, who, what would you say was one of the, the worst, like you got treated the worst? Maybe didn't, you know. The, yeah, the Arizona, Arizona was absolute trash under, uh, <laughs> that was, uh, the way I was treated there amongst other players, uh, the day I hit the guarantee in my contract, I was sent down. Um, I also had a situation where we were going on an Eastern road, Eastern swing. And I remember going up to one of the coaches and saying, Hey, um, do you think there's any, I was called up at the time to Arizona. And this is when we were the Portland pirates. I remember being asking them like, do you think there's any reason I ought to bring all my stuff on the road trip? And that person looked at me and said, Oh, nobody told you, uh, we were going to flip you and uh, Louis Domingue out midway through the trip. Oh, that's news to me. I'm I'm only leading the American League with a 936 save percentage, and he's played 10 games so far this year, and you're going to flip us out right now? Are you serious? So um, that organization was cheap. That organization didn't reward people. That organization promoted people at the absolute wrong and inopportune times. Uh, and I have no problem saying that. That regime's not there anymore. I don't even care because that people need to hear it. That was a joke how that place was run. How it was run in Portland? It wasn't that bad, okay? I didn't have a big complaint with that, but that organization in general, really, really poor how they treated certain players, and especially when you're just trying to, like, dude, I was leading the American League that year and everything when middle of the season. Like, goals against, save percentage, I was the top. And if there was ever a time in my career that I deserved to get a fair shake at the National League level, I was 32, like, that was it. And when it didn't come, when my only start was on, the back end of a back-to-back -back where we traveled from Dallas to Colorado to play at altitude on a Sunday afternoon and we got waxed and I got waxed. I knew the time was up for me that the NHL dream full-time probably wasn't going to happen and uh, kind of have the aloofness of the Arizona Coyotes in 2014 to thank for that. <laughs> Well, don't worry, Mike. The ownership group that's in now, they've definitely cleaned things up. I agree. Uh, so that's a real answer, man. Yeah. You're going to get it from me. So I, I, yeah. I'm i not I shocked by about. that answer, but at the same point, I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I think it's fair to say, I mean, like that organization now, you know, I was this season, I was hosting Sirius XM and we had on, um, I believe, the CFO of that organization. And man, they're doing everything they can. I know they're facing uphill battle in Arizona, but and also speaking from the players that I've spoken with, it's things are much better now than they were during my time frame there. And that makes me really happy. Mike, I know as an NHL analyst for dailyfaceoff.com, um, you might not get to watch the AHL as much or feel as connected as you did um, back when you were playing there in your, in your playing career. Um, but it feels as if the league has shifted a lot, even, even in that three year span that you have, you know, retired from your playing days. Does the AHL feel different today than it did when you played? To a certain extent, I still think it is still I still think it has the heartbeat that it did when I played there as well. You still have your veteran players. You know, you still have the prospects coming through. You still have the smaller towns now that that cling on to their franchise as a stalwart in the city. But there has been the shift, right? Now you have Calgary and Calgary. 
and San Jose's in San Jose, Winnipeg's in Winnipeg. Like from from a standpoint like that, where the travel isn't as isn't as regional as it once was, it's changed, and the league has gone younger. I, I do think that that has been a real focus of it now that you see more entry level. You don't see as many middle class players, I would call them, because it's kind of make it or break it. Like if you're not an elite level player by the third year of your entry level, you're you're scrounging around, right? You either make the NHL or you don't. So I was very lucky during my time with the Vegas Golden Knights when I was employed by them for a couple of seasons on their broadcast team to be able to work Henderson Silver Knights games in the inaugural year. Uh, and, and it was just really cool to see how one Vegas has grown up. I played for the Las Vegas Wranglers in the ECHL, and now there's an American League team. And, you know, I got to do color commentary for those games and see players like Logan Thompson light it up, you know, who's going to be, who I believe will be the number one goalie for the Vegas Golden Knights this year. Um, and man, he was awesome for them and he cut his teeth there and other players. And so it was, it was great for me to have that chance to stay connected, um, to even do color commentary for the American League all-star game two years ago in Ontario, the last all-star game that was held before the COVID pandemic. You know, I got to call Martin Furk's hardest shot in the world. And this is two years removed from him beating our team at Syracuse in the color cup finals with that hardest shot in the world when he blew it past me. And now I get to call it live, you know? So um, I guess really to kind of come back and answer your question, like I really do think that the, that the heart of the American league is the same. It is still based on development, but you still have the veteran players who are critical to bringing along those young players. Uh, and and I, I'm grateful that teams, for the most part, still value them because coming through that system, some of the older guys that I learned from and, and was able to be teammates and friends with really mattered to me. You know, Kind of piggybacking, I'm going to kind of call an audible here because I was going to ask this a little bit later. But, you know, you mentioned doing color for Henderson, you know, with the Silver Knights there in the Orleans Arena where you used to play for the Wranglers. A little bit of nostalgia there for you, no doubt. But, um, you know, being able to see the progression of 2005 Las Vegas Wranglers mm -hmm. ECHL to 2019, 2020, 2021, bringing the Henderson Silver Knights in, um, how has minor league hockey – you know, grabbed hold again in the desert with that new dollar loan center. And, you know, with that in mind, like how's Henderson doing? And do you think Nevada deserves another ECHL team, say maybe in Reno? Well, there's always been talk about Reno while well, they held a franchise for a long time at the ECHL level. Um, and I'm not sure if they still do. I'd, I'd be surprised because you still have to pay league rates on them. Um, I think two is probably enough for now. Uh, I'm very curious to see how Henderson does five, 10 years out because there's always mm -hmm. an initial bump. Um, and, and Henderson is on the different side of town than the strip. Okay. It is a little bit off on its own, but you'll see this bump. And Vegas right now has experienced one of the greatest hockey booms that I've ever seen. It gets crazy to see what youth hockey is doing there. Um, it's not terribly dissimilar to what happened to my home city of St. Louis when the Blues came in 1967, um, it really spurred the youth hockey movement. But the, the question is really the staying power. You know, like the team's never going to go anywhere from Henderson because logistically that just works. Like, dude, that could just be – like the Golden Knights could write off $3 million bucks a year on that team and they would be fine because they're there. You know, you see your players all the time. You can call them up from right down the road. Um, but they have a phenomenal facility. They have had to put a good a product on the ice. And they do serve a community that's starved for pro sports and hockey. So um, it, it's just wild, though, having been out there to think that, man, with the Wranglers, we'd put, you know, 5,000, 5,500 in the Orleans Arena. And we were jammed about that. We were just, you know, pumped as could be. Great crowd. It was fun. Crazy promotions. And now you've got, I mean, 19,000 in T-Mobile and another seven over in Henderson at the Dollar Loan Center. Like, it's incredible to think, but it's also part of the special nature of Vegas. Like that, that first year had so many things happen that couldn't be foreseen that led to the perfect storm for hockey to take off. And, you know, it, it wasn't just the team being good. The team was good part and parcel to one of the greatest tragedies in world history, American history, the Route 91 shooting where 
you know, so many people lost their lives and were injured and fr personal friends of mine, you know, that were there. And I, that created a special moment for Vegas that that team has rallied around to this day. It's a bond that people there feel. Um, and, and I don't think it's going to go away. And that makes me, it's a bittersweet happiness knowing what may have caused some of that. But I think it's something that, that really has some staying power in the Valley. Switching gears once again, as we're in a completely whirlwind around a bunch of stuff here. Um, when it comes to common goalie numbers, your normal one that it looks like you you gravitated towards, definitely not a normal goalie number. What inspired you to choose 56 as your preferred jersey number? Simple. That was my dad's racing number. And I never wore it until my second year pro. It kind of dawned on me. I was like, you know what? I'm playing in Vegas. We're a glitzy team. We do weird promotions. I'm like... What are they going to care if I wear a, wear a weird number? You know, and I, was, and I tossed it at the equipment guy. I'm like, hey, I want to wear 56. What do you think? He's like, I don't care. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my second year pro. Previous to that, I'd always worn 29 because my first goalie hero was Greg Millen for the St. Louis Blues. He caught with his right hand like I did. And, um, you know, oddly enough, I got to catch up with him years later in Tampa when I made my NHL debut. And he had no idea. And that was a really cool moment to tell him, hey, dude, like, the reason I'm a goalie and wore 29 was was you, you know, um, but 56 was my dad's auto racing number. He raced um, Formula Continental, Super V's, and SCCA, which is it's club racing in North America. But in 1980, 82, 83, I mean, it was about as high level as you could get. He won the President's Trophy one year as the top amateur driver in the U.S., which is a trophy that's won by names like Roger Penske, Bobby Rahal, Jimmy Vassar, um, some if you know anything about racing, those are big names. And dad did that as well. So he used 56 as his racing number. My grandpa later used 56 as his hockey number. And to me, I just thought this would be a really cool way to continue that lineage because I wasn't any good at racing go-karts. Hockey, I was better at. Um, and now my daughters who are six and nine, they, they like to wear the same number too. So it's pretty special for our family. Very cool. Very cool. So speaking of jerseys, this story is now rather, well, it's pretty infamous now. Um, January 2019, playing for Ottawa, traded to Vancouver while they were in town, then being claimed off of waivers by Philly three days later, three NHL teams in a week span. I remember, Mike, in early 2020, 2020, seems like early 2020 was 100 years ago, you were trying to track down that elusive Vancouver Canucks game-worn jersey and obviously a lot has happened since then, and I haven't seen an update anywhere. I tried doing research and everything, but did you ever find that jersey? And when was the last time you saw it before it went missing? Uh, last time I saw it was when I wore it, okay. <laughs> which was, <laughs> uh, I believe, in the Montreal, well, in the Bell Center. I can't say Montreal Forum, but in Bell Center. Centre Bell, if anybody out there, parle français, which I don't do very well. <laughs> um, I backed up two games between, but behind Jacob Markstrom wearing a white Vancouver Canucks jersey. And I can't get it. It's it's like the white whale of my jersey collection that I really want because it's this, first of all, it's an NHL jersey, okay? Like I dressed games for nine teams. I played for seven. I know that's what comes up on my hockey database, but I also dressed a handful of games for the Florida Panthers. I dressed two games for the Vancouver Canucks. Like I was there, I ate pucks and warmups and I took the morning skate and I got paid, you know? So it's like, I actually, it's funny because I actually have the NHL record for NHL teams dressed for. It's me, Sean Burke and Ron Tugnut with nine games. And those dudes played like 2000 combined games to my three dozen, which is hysterical. Um, but here I am, right? So I can't, I, I think I know who has it. We, we, collectively among the jersey collecting community which i know a couple people in we think we know who has that jersey i have sent a private facebook message to that person as politely as i could to just say please i would love to have this jersey it's i'll pay for it it's yeah. it's for my daughters it, they're going to be theirs and i haven't heard back and um so that jersey is missing and I believe it's still in Vancouver. The team sold it. Um, yeah, and that's typical. Like, players didn't used to get their jerseys, man. Now there's – it's kind of known as the Mike McKenna rule where I I made enough of a stink about it now that in the last CBA, players get two jerseys a year. And that's the way it should be. Like, And I'm not talking about the guys who are there all season. Okay, when I finished in the NHL with, with Dallas, I got a jersey. 
when I finished with Tampa, I got a jersey. But those guys that get called up and play one or two games, maybe that's all they get in their NHL career. Are you telling me that they can't get their jersey? Yeah. That's bullshit. Yeah. And you've got bullshit. and you've got e-bugs that go out for warm-ups for five minutes and sit on a bench and they get to keep a jersey. And the guy who's bled for a team and a city and an organization an entire career doesn't get their jersey. Yeah. That really pissed me off. And so I was pretty vocal about that on social and other places. And thankfully in the last CBA, you know, I, I'll take credit for it, whether I should or shouldn't, I'm going to. <laughs> I'm happy that now the players at least get what they wore and what they played for, man. Like it's important to us, you know? So I think we're in a better place with that now. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, we would be remiss if we didn't ask you for some stories and memories of guys you've had the privilege to play with. So I was hoping to kind of give you a few names here. And hope you tell us a bit about, you know, what they were maybe like behind the scenes, maybe a story or two about them that they wouldn't, you know, send you DMs and be like, Mike, what did you tell <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Who you got first? Let's go. All right. First up, uh, Texas Stars assistant coach Travis Morin. Oh, big Mo. Just a big nerd. Just an absolute nerd. He loves, he loves barbecue. He loves brisket. Um, he actually got really good at using his Traeger and making baby back ribs and doing a little apple cider spritz on them. And uh, but Mo was Mo was such a good and sneaky player, like great hands, big leather cuffs on the gloves, old school, not a lot of curve on a stick, left handed. He was not a good shooter at all. But he was deceptive with it. Like, he didn't shoot that hard, but he could beat you. Like, he's the guy that would come in on a breakaway and just flick his wrist a little and throw you off and beat you clean with a shot, even if it wasn't hard. Travis Morin is probably one of the smartest hockey players that I shared the ice with. I mean, for sure at the American League level, um, you know, and, and I, what you know, the reasons why he didn't get time at the NHL is probably similar to me. You know, wrong place, wrong time. He had to work his way up from the ECHL, but just a, the nicest guy. And an unbelievable half wall quarterback on the power play. And just really a guy that I love to be around because we we both like to grill. We both love Texas. And um, it's been cool to see him stay with the Texas organization post-career. Next guy for you, jumping over from Bakersfield to Tucson uh, this offseason, Adam Cracknell. Crack daddy. So now we're talking about, like, I've got a team of guys that are – Forever teammates. Adam Cracknell, forever teammate. He lived in my house for about three weeks during a blues training camp one year. Made him pork steaks nonstop. We went to golf a few times. He saw me smash a driver on a tee box. Cracks was, Cracks was so awesome because he showed up in Vegas at 20 years old for the ECHL team. And man, was he naive to the world, right? Like he had a $70,000 Escalade with his entry-level deal. Like, I don't know if he say I don't know if he kept a penny from his entry level deal, you know. <laughs> and I remember we all thought this guy's never going to make it. Well, he broke his leg really bad in Idaho, and yeah. he missed a lot of a season and turned into a workout fiend. And talk about somebody that blossomed and became a leader and became somebody that I really looked up to and respected in the sport. I never expected that from Adam Cracknell. So the metamorphosis of him from his first year to what he's become now has been incredible to watch. We got to be teammates again several times throughout our careers in Peoria later. Uh, we, you know, even in Dallas, he was there for training camp, and I thought he'd be there longer. He ended up leaving on waivers. But, man, he's he's somebody who I think has earned every dollar he's gotten. And he's got some pretty well, – you should get him going because, man, he's been to China and back and, like <laughs> – He's got stories for it, but Cracks can shoot the puck as hard as anybody. He put a puck through the boot break of my pad, um, and I will never forget that. And I'm he is a forever teammate, man. He is somebody who is always welcome in my guest room. All right. Next up, we have uh, current Abbotsford Canuck, Sheldon Dries. And before I let you start, his mother follows us on Twitter. And I've already had to apologize to her in the, in the middle of the season because I thought he wouldn't keep up the scoring streak. So just with that in <laughs> mind, what do you have on show? <laughs> Terrible guy. Can't stand him. No. <laughs> um, 
So here's here's the fun part. Like we've kind of come full circle to the Dallas organization. We've talked about Travis Morin, talked about Adam Cracknell, Sheldon Dries. We were all in Dallas's organization to start a year in the 27-18 season. So Sheldon Dries shows up, and I don't think we really knew much about him, but he kept scoring during the regular season in Texas for us. And he was fast, and he played with jam. And that's not something every player does. You can't just will a player to having enough of a heartbeat to go into hard areas and play with an edge. And for a rookie like Sheldon Dries, when we were teammates, during the regular season, I kept thinking, man, this kid's got something going here. I think this, I think it's going to catch the eye of somebody. Well, by playoffs, he was awesome for us. And I, and I don't know what his stat line was through the Calder Cup playoffs in 2018, 20, yeah, 2018, but I think he scored nine or 10 goals easily. I don't know if he had an assist, which is pretty funny, uh, but he was a spark plug and he smiled and he had a great attitude. Um, and just another guy that like, when he got his chance with Colorado the next year, I was like, man, awesome. Like I wish he would have. I wish he could have stayed with Dallas for selfish reasons, even though I wasn't there because they gave him his first break. But um, he's been kind of one of those classic cases where it's like, man, just right place, right time. I think he could stick in the NHL, but he's still waiting for that right moment. You know, great wheels, good shot, plays hard. Like he's really, like he's a coach's dream, man. He's the type of player that you want to have on your roster. Because uh, I got, to, I, I have the God Machine in front of me. Uh, Twenty-two games played that playoffs, ten goals, no assists. That's it. He was, I mean, he was our Cy Young winner, no question. But he scored some big goals, man. And and for a rookie, that's a big deal, right? Like, I mean, our rookies that season were Sheldon Dries and Rope Hints were the big dogs for our rookie crew. Gavin Bayruther as well, who's now a defenseman with the Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, and I don't want to, you know, he's a former St. Lawrence University player as well as myself. So I don't want to like bring Gavin down, but like, you know, Dries, Hints, Bayruther, you could see why our team in Texas went to the Calder Cup Finals because we also had veterans like, you know, we had Curtis McKenzie, Travis Morin, Greg Rallo, Justin Dowling. I, we had we had a good club, but you know the biggest factor? We had a fun club. And after every round we won in playoffs, we had a big barbecue that I hosted. We played sand volleyball. Andrew Bodner, Chuck's wife at the time, blew her knee out playing volleyball. It was great. We had so much fun, uh, and eventually everybody got healthy. <laughs> Good to hear. So shift over to head coaching. Let's talk about Milwaukee Admirals bench boss, Carl Taylor. Mm. So KT was our assistant coach, again, with the Texas Stars. Um, probably one of the – just a, a an imposing individual. You know what I mean? Like big head, big stocky body. Like, um, But KT was – was kind of like the natural foil to Derek Laxdell, who was our head coach at the time in, in Texas. And, and I think they were a really good pairing because, you know, KT had an ability to kind of reach to us on a personal level at times, you know, and Derek could put in Lax could kind of play, you know, the older disciplinarian a bit, but like we were, we were kind of invested with those guys, right? It was never a situation where either of them were adversarial to say, and I think that's why KT's had, Carl Taylor's had the success he has in Milwaukee is because, you know, he understands how to relate to today's player. And I think he was a little bit ahead of his curve in that way. And I think it helped that he came from the ECHL. And I also think that having great assistant coaches in Milwaukee and Scott Ford and Greg Rollo has helped propel him as well. You've got a staff there of guys that I think the world of. Scott Ford, teammates in Peoria Riverman with myself. Like we're talking six degrees of Mike McKenna here, right? So <laughs> Scott Ford was he was a man. He was a man. Like he he showed up to Thanksgiving dinner at my apartment and I think he ate a log of salami and drank two bottles of wine and he was on the bike at six AM the next day. Okay. He was an unbelievable captain and leader and worker. And then Greg Rollo and I date back to the Springfield Junior Blues in the North American Hockey League when we were, you know, night. Well, I was 17 and 18. He was 19 and 20. And then we come back full circle all those years later with the Texas Stars. Now he's with the Milwaukee Admirals. Um, that's a great staff. And another organization that, you know, through my time with the PHPA, I was on exec board for 10 years. I, I was chairman of uh, the American League players. 
you know, I got to know a lot of people in front offices and the front office in Milwaukee, the front office in Texas, the front office in Syracuse, man, are those people awesome across the board. People that I was genuinely happy to play for and get to do things with. And I played for Milwaukee for three weeks, but <laughs> I can tell you though, that that's a team that I've really admired for a long time. And especially with the way they do business with Nashville, that's been a really, really good synergy there. I mean, I remember during the pandemic when they, they folded, they, they couldn't, you know, uh, mm -hmm. host games because it just wasn't financially viable for them. Yeah. And they said that like, but we're still going to pay our staff through the break. And I'm like, this organization, like, congratulations, I'm going to buy your, your jersey right now because that's, that's an A-plus organization that I respect. Yeah. All right, last one that I have here for the uh, names out of a hat round here. Although I know we could go on, we could do this for hours. Uh, former Hershey Bears head coach, now current Washington Capitals assistant coach, Scott Allen. I get the biggest smile on my face because Scott Allen was the best coach I've ever had in my life. Wow. And I don't mean that to, to, to like, dude, I've had great coaches. But Scott Allen and I go back so far. We go back to the Omaha Sarban Knights, assistant coach there, training camp, two years in a row. I remember Scotty Allen used to ride his Harley into the building. He's a big Colts fan. The Colts win the Super Bowl. He comes out on the ice with a big Fu Manchu mustache and a cigar and a bandana with the Colts on, skating around, happy as can be. And, and I remember back then thinking the world of this guy. And I show up in Peoria. He's the assistant coach in Peoria. And on a personal level, I had a great year in Peoria. Team wasn't very good, but man, we had a lot of fun. And a lot of that had to do with Scott. It had to do with our head coach, Dave Allison, who's one of the biggest co biggest characters in all of hockey. But Scotty was one of the most detailed coaches I've ever played for. And then I get to Portland, Maine, and the team transitions from being the Arizona affiliate that we talked about previously to being the Florida Panthers affiliate. And guess who's coming into town as an assistant coach? Scott Allen. So it's our third team together at this point. And I had the best year of my career playing for Scott. He took over midway through as a head coach when Tom Rowe bumped himself up to general manager of the Florida Panthers and then bumped himself up to head coach of the Florida Panthers. Um, and then bumped and then was bumped out of that very quickly, um, ironically. But Scott Allen took my career to levels that I didn't know was capable. And he did it in the best way in that we could look each other in the eye and say anything. I remember coming in the day, the day I remember playing like three and three one weekend and my birthday was on Monday or something. I remember looking at Scott and going, Scotty, we don't play till Friday. I've just played like three in a row. I'm going out Monday. And he goes, okay, just be here Tuesday. And I'm not a partier. I would like to consider myself not a drunk, but I got to tell you that that day at practice was the most hungover I've ever been on the ice in my life. And I remember Scott looking at me and just going, Maka, I thought we were going to need toothpicks to keep your eyes open. But you did great. We'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs> and, you know, he but, – but that's the mark of a good coach. They know when to let players have some fun and who can handle it, okay? And you want a penalty kill that's going to be successful? There's your guy. Look what he did with the Arizona Coyotes. Look what he did with the Florida Panthers. Look what he did with the New York Islanders. Look what he's going to do with the Washington Capitals. I would put my money behind Scott Allen any day. And it's not just his coaching ability, it's that he's just an amazing guy. I remember before the 2018 Calder Cup Finals, I called him and I said, Scott, if we win this thing, I just, I hope that you're going to come to the party. And he said, I'll be there on my hog because he still rides a Harley, right? He's like, I will be there. And so we have that pact to this day. If he wins the Stanley Cup, man, wherever his party is, I will be there. I think the world of him. He is the best and he's so much fun to play for. If you haven't gotten the chance yet, when he got named the head coach of the Hershey Bears, we made a meme called Scott Allen versus the world. Uh, you should look that up because I had a lot of fun making that. But uh, I made but one. I, so I, I used to be big on Photoshop. Okay. So I, I had a picture of him when we were in Portland. We were going into playoffs. Had a picture of him on his Harley on a pirate ship. And like her team motto, like I Photoshopped the motto. I should Photoshop the whole thing. 
I've got that somewhere. So yeah, Scotty's now going to be internet famous by the end of this thing. I would I would love to see that photo, Mike. Hold we want to be see respectful. If I can pull it up and really. <laughs> All right, I will find that meme later. I will start on my, my big question here because goaltending is basically voodoo to me. It's difficult okay. to predict year to year, statistically very noisy, and it feels like a lot of the variables that go into goalie performance are difficult to measure, at least in our current state. Um, I'm also not a goaltender, which adds the difficulty in understanding the position, and I've done my best to learn more about it. Your work has been incredibly helpful, along with like Kevin Woodley, Kat Silverman, uh, Stefan Valakit. They've certainly helped me understand but I want to ask you some questions about analyzing goalie play because I don't like that it's this big black hole weakness in me trying to understand the sport. One of the things, though, I wanted to ask you about is uh, about remarks you made about guys like John Gibson and Matt Murray mm -hmm. saying in rough terms in other places that they never adapted a more modern style uh, of mm -hmm. goaltending. And I heard you say that. I'm like, I have no idea what that means. But like, I could, like you spoke it with intention, like you knew what it meant, but I didn't get it. I was hoping you could expand on that more because sure. I understand John Gibson has really fallen out of favor the last couple of years, despite the fact that I absolutely love him. And as a Penguins fan, I never really believed in Matt Murray. So you've given me the idea that I was onto something, but I don't know so, what it is. So what does, yeah. So Matt Murray is actually, to me, and we're dealing with two goaltenders who are far better than I ever was. Let's preface it by saying that, okay? But I do think that I have license to provide analysis on them because if I can't provide analysis on goaltenders, who can, right? Kevin Woodley, Stephen Valaket, Kevin Weeks, mm -hmm. they all have license to provide it because they've been there. Matt Murray to me in the American Hockey League was the best goalie I ever saw at that level. He was insanely good. And I thought he carried that through the first about year and a half of his NHL career, two years maybe. And then I think that as the game progressed and became faster and became more east-west and lateral, his reliance upon technique over actual puck stopping has really hurt him. I think he's too static at times. I think he gets stuck in his post integrations. I think he's just forgotten how to battle, how to be a goalie and an athlete. And I think for the past couple of years, especially going to Ottawa, which was a terrible team, he's just struggled. He hasn't been able to find confidence in what he's doing. So I actually feel, I feel a little bit optimistic about Murray going to Toronto because he needs to play for a good team where he can feel good about himself again, first off, and then let those bad habits kind of filter out, let him be a goalie again. And then you look on the other side of John Gibson who's an incredible natural athlete, crazy athleticism, but he hasn't changed his game in seven years. It's the same game. And to me, John Gibson's playing street hockey. He's spread, he's in the splits, he's all over the place, he's sliding past the post, he's not square. And it doesn't just lead to more goals against, it leads to him getting hurt more often. So I think that if Gibson could could really dive in on the technicality of what goaltenders have done in the last three, four years, and if he could also take a look at the depth of goaltenders and realize you don't want to be three feet outside of the blue paint and the white ice, it would really help him. So, you know, there's a lot to both of those goaltenders. They're both NHL goalies. They could both be great again. But in my eyes, they're neither goalie that I would trust right now because I don't see on Gibson's behalf, I don't see the structure. And then on Murray's behalf, I just don't see the natural puck stopping. I see more technique over I do over what I see uh, from a naturally gifted goaltender that he had when he was younger. He's got to reclaim that. And that's going to be up to Curtis Sanford, who's the new goaltending coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs, is to try to eat that back out of Matt Murray and make him successful again. Right. Right. Now, kind of to piggyback that, um, you know, we're talking about the NHL, AHL dynamic. You know, it's 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 bound to happen in conversation. Sean actually got to ask Kat Silverman this question. I wanted to pose it to you, too. Skating is what seems to be the most common reason that an AHL star skater never makes the NHL. Why do you think or what do you think is the most common reason an, NA, or an AHL star goalie never makes it to the NHL? I'm skating. <laughs> Make it easy on you. Okay. There you go. 
I mean, that's a simplified answer. Um, I actually think that because goaltending is so hard to predict, there's a lot of goalies that have expectations foisted upon them that probably aren't realistic because they've been on really good teams and people just go, he was a money goaltender on a big team. He's got to be good. And there's still, like you look at the scouting world, man, there's not enough goalie scouts out there. There's not goalie departments. There's not enough eyes for the people who really understand the position to make those judgment calls. And so you just get goalies filtered through that one games. Great. You won games for a team that crushed everybody. And, I, and those are goalies that like right now, I don't want to know, name those names because some of them are friends, but dude, like I can remember some back to the college days going, this guy sucks and he's a top 10 draft pick. And it took him six years to be an NHL goalie. And only then it was because he kind of got lucky, you know, like this is what you'd see from a goalie's lens, but from a regular, you know, scout's lens, it's like, he's a big game goalie because they saw him play like one game and he was really good. He's flying by the seat of his pants, which you can do. And it's the reason why any goalie, East HL or Buff can go, you can walk in the NHL and play a great game, but can you be consistent? Okay. I couldn't straight up, man. Like I, I was a damn good American league goalie, but I never found my consistency in the NHL. I didn't. So I think that, you know, when you kind of flip it back to that question, like the American League goalies, they can really bring it. They can really skate. They're square. They're detailed in their game. Look at the best goalie on earth right now, Igor Shishjurkin. That guy's skating is so efficient and so crisp and so clean, and he's square early, and that lets him track pucks. It lets him be patient. He's not late. You can't get around that very well. And I'll give you one example here. And I'm curious to see how it plays out because I think he's got a lot of natural skill. But Aiden Hill is somebody who, to me, you know, we when I was with Texas, we beat him in the second round of playoffs. In 2018 Calder Cup playoffs, he was with the Tucson Roadrunners. He played awesome. Awesome. This guy's got natural skill like crazy. Big body. But that big body has allowed him to rely on that big body. And he's never learned to skate. And it really got exposed last year in San Jose. Hands aren't great. If that's a, if he could go to school during the summer and really learn how to move and get square and sit with his toes at the top of the crease and wait on shots and be patient, Aiden Hill could be scary. But he's got to work for it. And sometimes that natural that like that ability may not be there. I don't really truly in my heart of hearts believe that I had the top end ability to be a star in the NHL. I think that I had the top end smarts to do it. I think I outthought my ability. But boy, I wish I would have had the skill to be able to go along with it. Because that's, there's skill, there's work, there's mental. You need all three of those to be a star in the NHL and to stick in the NHL. If you're missing any of those three, it's not going to work. And, and that's where I think a lot of goalies get stuck. And, and skating is just a huge factor. Because you're, if you're not square to that shot in the NHL, try to stop an Austin Matthews shot. Go for it. It's not going to go well. Yeah. Interesting. Because that's a very different answer than what Kat Silverman gave me. But I think I like I like yours a lot too. I think she uh, hers was uh, scrambling. That like there are so many goalies that they have good structure, they have good reaction time, but when things break down in front of them, they don't know how to just abandon it all and make the damn save. Well, and I thought, let me let me piggyback to that, Sean. I actually think that our answers are very similar in that way. Because if you're a great skater, if you're good on your knees and your skates you can stay within that structure and get ready for the next shot. You don't have to scramble. So again, what Kat said, and I think a lot of Kat, I think that we're actually in the same house, but all it took was a goalie to kind of explain that within that paradigm, it all fits together because you want to be on your edges as much as you can and be in control. Perfect. I did find that Scott Allen meme, so I'm going to show that to you now because it is one of my favorite uh, Photoshops that we've done. Da, 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 da. That guy. Oh, that's great. And it's good that you've got him with uh, – it's really good that you've got him with the, the goatee because I think that's critical, <laughs> um, especially knowing Scotty. That, that was – that's important. Uh, and it makes me want to look for the one I did with him and I can't find it. I was looking to share one for you as well. But oh, oh, look at that grouping of people. Yeah. <laughs> That's that was great. that was one of my favorite photoshops. I spent way too much time doing that. 
But uh, that's a great have, guy, man. We got two more two more questions here for you. I would love to play Story Orama with you for the AHL, and basically we could be here until you know the sun comes up with fun AHL stories, which just says to me we need to have you back on at some point in the future. Uh, but there is one story that I've heard you told, and because it has significance to some of the goofiness we do on our show, I want to ask you about if you could tell the story about the time you were almost arrested as Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh, that well, that was a case. That was a case of mistaken identity. Um, so this was Halloween, 2008, Norfolk, Virginia, at the Rotunda, which is a building a lot of guys lived in, and I was very clearly dressed as the macho man, Randy Savage. I had the sunglasses on with the neon lines. I had tassels. I had the hat. I had the, the bandana that said macho man. I had mascara in my beard. Like I was the macho man, Randy Savage. And a couple of our euros got a little crazy and decided to throw beers off at the top of the rotunda. One of them almost hit a cop car. The cops come up and the cops go, you, you, we need the pirate. We need the stay puff man. And we need Hulk Hogan. <laughs> and the cop, the cop looked at me and pointed at me, and I, I'm looking at him going, I'm clearly Macho Man Randy Savage. I'm not the Hulkster here. It's clear as day. It says Macho Man on the back of my outfit. Well, I was in a brief detention until it was ascertained that I was not Hulk Hogan. I was not guilty of throwing a beer can off the roof that I was in fact the macho man, Randy Savage. But I'm looking at this whole scenario thinking like, am I gonna go to jail for the first time in my life dressed as the macho man? Is there any <laughs> worse way to go to jail wearing spandex with mascara in your beard? <laughs> no, the answer is no, there's no worse way. So I'm glad the cops got that right, but I'm also really disappointed in the cops. They didn't know their wrestling history. Like, you can't mistake the macho man for Hulk Hogan. So shame on the Norfolk PD. We we have a segment called the cream of the crop. And, of course, one of Macho Man's famous promos is him <laughs> with the little cream. Is it to the crop, Mean Gene? Let me tell you something, Mike. Let me tell had, you something. Dude, it rises to the top. Yeah. I had Sorry, slim, go ahead. Oh yeah, I had Slim Jims and every I was giving out Slim Jims to everybody there. <laughs> Elizabeth, like, yeah, well, cool, you got lust scene, in man. your eyes, brother. I'm going to jail, not you. What's wrong with this picture? It was the yeah. same, dude. I was like so amped about that costume, and I nearly went to the clink. Oh my <laughs> god, that's a All great right. story. Oh. Our our last question here. Uh, Again, we definitely have to have you back because I think we deleted like 10 questions here because we're, you know, trying to be respectful. I'm long-winded, man. That's what I do. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but you have been one of the best guests we've ever had. Like, this has been fantastic. We could be here for hours. Last question we have. What is your hottest food take? <laughs> Charcuterie sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, adult Lunchables, man, like people try to call me a foodie. I'm like, I don't really like cheese, cured meats, like whatever, dude. Like security just is not the thing. I want to make pizza. I want to make tacos and I want to do barbecue. That's what makes me happy. Charcuterie can take a hike, but if you bring it to my house, I will probably eat it. <laughs> John, that's what, what's your hot take, Shawnee? Uh, I have my, my hot take, which I didn't think was a hot take, was I think pineapple is a completely acceptable pizza tapa. Pizza topping. Like, the people who go nuts about that, I'm like, I think it's fine. Like, do I put pizza or pineapple on all of my pizzas? No, of course not. But, like, I've had it, and it's okay. So my, my daughter, my nine-year-old daughter loves it on there. And I actually, like, I've started to really appreciate sweet and salty things as I've gotten older, so I understand why, and I agree. I don't love it myself, but when it comes to pizza, because I make it often, I don't think there should be rules with pizza, okay? This isn't like a hot dog where you shouldn't put ketchup on a hot dog, and I'll hold to that. You should put mustard on one, but he's from the Midwest. I think with a pizza, you should be, I, I, and realistically, the food in general, man, there really shouldn't be boundaries. Some of the best things we've ever come up with, we're talking about like, Dude, Korean tacos. Are you kidding me how good those are? Yes. You know what I mean? That wasn't a thing. Like, that's an absolute bastard matchup, you know? And it's so good. And that's that's why I get mad when people are like, you can't do that with food. It's like, man, there shouldn't be rules, except for ketchup on a hot dog. 
That's a pretty hot food. Well, not my my food wife food will argue food. my hot food take is that a uh, string cheese should just be bitten like all other food that exists. Like my kids and, would agree. Yeah, <laughs> like, apparently, people peel it, and I think that's insane. Uh, I. Like every other food, you just bite. That's how you eat it. And it's like, no, but string cheese, there are special eating way. No, bite it. You bite the food. But that, that's, those are, those are my food hot takes. Mike, it has been absolutely phenomenal. We, we will probably request uh, to have you back at some point, whether next off season or some weird down point where we can all like hang out and have a good time. Uh, Anywhere that, you know, if people who are listening to our episode somehow have stumbled under a rock that they live and can't <laughs> find your work, uh, where can people find your, your good goalie takes and otherwise excellent food takes? So uh, the easiest way is it's at Mike McKenna 56, whether it's Twitter or Instagram, I always make sure I post everything I do, but I really want to direct people to dailyfaceoff.com. Like we're not just a fantasy website anymore. We have full content, Frank Saravalli. Dr. Evil uh, is our guy, okay, like the greatest insider you could imagine. We have fresh content pieces, analysis, opinion, all coming from me and from other writers. Realistically, if you're into the NHL, you could lock on Daily Faceoff and get everything you need. So I, I always try to promote that because, you know, we're doing the best we can to provide content that's good, that's up to date. And you know what? When we do specials, we're not like the other big dogs. We don't have commercials. You can watch us right through when we do our draft show and we do our free agency show. So um, dailyfaceoff.com, at Mike McKenna 56. And I am always happy to engage. So please, by all means, send me a message, send me a DM, send me, uh, send me an at. That's the easiest way. I'm always happy to get in there. All right. Once again, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, I use daily face off uh, during the hockey season because I bet on hockey and I need starting goaltenders. I mm -hmm. need to know if it's going to be Shesterkin or some guy. And that makes a big difference in my, my financial decisions, unfortunately. So this year it's uh, good that some guy's going to be Yaro Halak if it's not Igor Shesterkin. <laughs> uh, great. That's going to, that's going to shift how my money gets burned. So, uh, Thank you so much, Mike, for your time. Uh, we will hopefully be talking to you again sometime in the future because this has been absolutely everything I hoped for and more. Uh, we will uh, be right back to wrap up the show. But, Mike, thank you so much. We uh, hope you do well in the season coming up. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. It's always fun to talk about the American League the rest of my career. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. That will do it for the show. Thank you all for watching and or listening. The Calder Farmstead is part of the Full Press Radio Network. You can listen to this and several other great hockey, sports, and pro wrestling programs at www.fullpresscoverage.com. They've got all the bases covered, no pun intended. Just click on the podcast drop-down menu in the top right portion of the website. Brrr, that is the large list populating there. That's what that noise was. Click on that top right portion of the website on that list and enjoy. And if you guys are enjoying the Calder Farmstead, uh, please make sure you subscribe so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Amazon, please rate and review the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video, comment what you thought of the episode. Doing so helps others find the show and your reviews help us improve it. You can also follow the show on social media. We have a lot of fun on the social media platforms. Uh, we are at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at the Calder Farmstead on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, big thanks to Adrian Drake, who made our theme music. You can find him. Sorry. Wow. I am rusty. You could tell it's been time off. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to just start from the beginning of that paragraph? And uh, Yeah. Where, where did you mess up? Uh, I was like, these are our social media links, and then completely forgot to read the link tree. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, just start from the top of your paragraph there. All right. And if you guys are enjoying the Calder Farmstead, please make sure to subscribe so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Amazon, please rate and review the episode. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, like the episode, uh, comment what you thought of the show. Doing so helps others find the show, and your reviews help us improve it. You can also follow the show on social media. We have a pretty good time there. Uh, we are at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at the Calder Farmstead on Instagram, and Facebook. Links to all of that and more can be found in our Linktree page, which is scrolling below here, but also uh, if you're on the audio version, that is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash -E The Calder Farmstead. 
I hope you can spell that part on your, your own. Big thanks to Adrian Drake, who made our theme music. You can find him on social media at AD underscore dysfunction. That's AD underscore D-Y-S-F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N. So we can make music for you too. Cece, where can people find you? Well, my name is CC Hockley. You can find me representing Full Press Hockey on Twitter at FPC underscore AHL. Uh, doing my best to keep folks updated on all the AHL transactions and news that is happening this offseason. I feel like we've done a pretty pretty bang up job, pretty good job this offseason in regards to that. If you want to follow my personal Twitter account at CC Hawk, that's at S E E S E E H A W K. I obviously hockey is going to be the primary focus there, but I like pro wrestling. I like classic rock, prog rock, rush, Genesis, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully if it keeps me interested, it's not going to be bullshit for you. Check out my writing on the full press coverage network. And of course the writing of that of the AHL team at www.fullpresshockey.com. Enough about me, Sean, where can the people find you? Well, you can't find my writing anywhere because spoiler alert, I actually don't know how to write. Um, but I am Sean O'Brien. You can lie. find me on Twitter at Sean O'Brien 81. That's S E A N O B R I E N 81. Uh, I'm also on Instagram at Sean O'Brien underscore 81. Uh, my Twitter is more hockey related, but there are, you know, some anecdotes of about the world around me in there. My Instagram is more uh, cute pictures of my dog. Um, you can find all of my stats work at Tableau and at uh, bit.ly slash data dump and chase. All lowercase. All one word. Cece, this has been a fun, fun episode. I have really enjoyed talking to Mike McKenna, but it is time. Take us home. Oh, absolutely. And that will do it for episode number 108 of the Calder Farmstead podcast. And like Sean said, once again, thank you so much to Mike McKenna, HL legend, for coming on the program and gracing us with his presence. We really appreciate it, Mike. Thank you so much. And that will do it. So for Sean O'Brien, I'm CeCe Hockley. Thank you again for all of our viewers and listeners out there. Thanks for tuning into the show. Thanks for hanging with us during our two-month respite, our two-month sabbatical, as it were. And as always, keep your stick on the ice.